somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Et qui défendait la liberté d'expression. The moment you limit free speech is not free speech. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. Welcome to Clear and Present Danger, a history of free speech by Jakob Mshengama. Clear and Present Danger relies on the generous support of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, Fridor, and the Politiken Foundation. Episode 5. The Not-So-Dark Ages. Medieval Intellectuals and Free Thinkers. Since 2000, free speech organization FIRE has registered more than 160 successful attempts by students to disinvite speakers at American colleges and universities. And around 2014, new words such as microaggressions, safe spaces and trigger warnings entered the debate on where the line should be drawn on controversial speech in higher education. Take the University of California, which published a list of some 50 microaggressions that might be offensive or hurtful to students and faculty. They included statements such as, there's only one race, the human race, and I believe the most qualified person should get the job. Sometimes the debates get heated and even violent with controversies or clashes at elite universities like Berkeley, Middlebury and Yale. Some see in this an illiberal turn by a new generation of students and administrators discarding the value of academic freedom in favor of ideological conformity in curricula, classroom discussions and campus life. But what does this very modern phenomenon have to do with the Middle Ages, I hear you ask? Well, clashes over academic freedom is nothing new. In fact, medieval universities were born out of controversy, and indeed often violent conflict. And just as today, there were heated debates over what could be taught, said and questioned without endangering the values thought most essential. Although the stakes were quite a bit higher back then. Being burned at the stake was not a metaphor for being smeared on Twitter, shouted down by students, or frozen out by faculty. The medieval academic clashes were not so much due to a strict religious stranglehold on intellectual life, but rather a sometimes desperate rearguard action to control the tide of reason and rationality that sprouted up from around the 12th century and grew into a cultural trait through the cross-fertilization of universities and rediscovery of classical works, not least Aristotle, in the 13th century. Yes, you heard that right. The High Middle Ages were an age of reason and inquiry as much as inquisition and superstition. This belies the popular misconception of the so-called Dark Ages, indicating a thousand years of darkness between antiquity and the Renaissance. Medieval has even become synonymous with torture and violence in modern pop culture. Take pop fiction. When mob boss Marcellus Wallace says, I'ma get medieval on your ass, to the rapist Seth, we're not meant to think that Marcellus is about to engage in reasoned discussion in order to convince Seth to mend his wicked ways. But medievalists have long painted a more nuanced picture of the Middle Ages. As early as 1927, the great American medievalist Charles Homer Haskins wrote, Modern research shows us the Middle Ages less dark and less static. The Middle Ages exhibit life and color and change, much eager search after knowledge and beauty, much creative accomplishment in art, literature and institutions. No doubt, Christian doctrine cast its shadow on intellectual life. For the majority of human history, not to believe in God has been pretty much as inconceivable as not believing in electricity today. And the Middle Ages were not different. And this fact clearly influenced the way people thought and were allowed to think. As we'll witness in an upcoming episode, 
The Middle Ages would also see periods of systematic and appalling persecution of heretics, homosexuals and Jews. And there were also limits to free thinking and academic pursuit. Reason would not be entirely unleashed from the limits of revelation for several centuries to come. But the schools of the 12th century and the universities of the early 13th century were also surprisingly democratic institutions. And the limits on what learned scholars could write and investigate were actually much wider than any notion of a dark age makes us believe. In fact, some of the intellectuals we'll meet in this episode boldly pushed the frontiers of reason and rationality, paving the way for later scientific and intellectual breakthroughs. But before we dive into the High Middle Ages, we need to back up a couple of centuries to where we left off in Episode 3. As you may recall, the Western Roman Empire collapsed towards the end of the 5th century. Everything resembling a state broke down from the British Isles to the Eastern Mediterranean. The only institution to survive was the Church. Despite disagreement on the extent of the collapse, most historians seem to agree that the Europe which emerged from the ashes of the Roman Empire was a more primitive world. Literacy almost disappeared outside the church. And it appears there wasn't much use in the ability to read either, because sadly the majority of ancient texts, 90% by some estimates, were lost forever. In short, intellectual life did not exactly flourish in Latin Europe in the immediate aftermath of Rome's fall. In the absence of an all-powerful Roman Empire, peoples like the Visigoths, the Lombards, the Saxons and the Franks settled down to draw the first sketches of the European map we're familiar with today. During the 7th and 8th centuries, the great Frankish kings gained the upper hand and formed a vast empire stretching all the way from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. The Franks would set off the first organized step in reviving the lost literary culture of antiquity. On Christmas Eve, in the year 800, the greatest of the Frankish kings persuaded the Pope to name him Holy Roman Emperor. His name was Charlemagne, and as his title indicates, he wanted to revive the Roman Empire in the West. But he needed ideological legitimacy. So he joined forces with the Church and invited some of the best intellectuals of his time to hang out at his court in Aachen. Together with this court of intellectuals, Charlemagne kicked off a number of educational reforms. We are concerned to restore with diligent seal the workshops of knowledge which through the negligence of our ancestors have been well nigh deserted. Latin was revived and a new fund, the Carolingian Minuscule, was devised. In fact, this fund is considered as the basis of the modern letters we use today every time we send an email or read a website in the Latin alphabet. Perhaps even more importantly, ancient texts were rescued from oblivion and copied in a growing network of monasteries. According to Yale professor Paul Friedman, only 264 manuscripts survived the period from 550 to the rise of the Carolingians in the 750s. Out of these 264 manuscripts, all except for 26 dealt with religious subjects. But by the 9th century, the number of secular classical manuscripts had grown to 290, thanks to Charlemagne and his hard-working monks. In fact, we can thank Charlemagne for some of the content of this podcast, provided by Roman historians like Tacitus and Livy, whose texts were rescued from collective amnesia during the Carolingian reforms. Last, but not least in a history of free speech, it was Charlemagne who, knowingly or not, steered Europe out of the religious ban on images that was enforced with the iconoclasm of the Byzantine Empire and much of the Muslim world. Still, this shouldn't fool us into believing that Charlemagne was somehow a proponent of free speech or thought. Heathens in Charlemagne's expanding theocratic empire were forced to convert and observe Christianity or be killed. Blasphemy was a capital crime, and the so-called adoptionists 
was snuffed out for holding that God adopted Jesus as his son. The impact of the Carolingian Renaissance was also limited to a close-knit elite intended to give the Carolingian clerical monarchy a small breeding ground for administrators and politicians. And it didn't combine translation of classical texts with the systematic use of intellectual reasoning that had taken place in the Abbasid Caliphate and that would become the norm a few centuries later when European universities arose. A truly radical transformation happened some two or three hundred years later. Around the turn of the millennium, new farming techniques were invented, and Europe's population virtually exploded, doubling or trebling in size between 1000 and 1300 AD. This period also saw crucial legal developments and dramatic duels between the two swords held by the church and secular authorities, respectively. These events spurred radical transformations which we cannot include in a history of free speech. With the growing population, towns and cities sprouted up all over the map. This was the real driver behind the 12th century Renaissance, as it has been called by later historians. With urbanization, the division of labor was introduced and a new class of city-dwelling merchants and craftsmen evolved. This didn't just include bakers and blacksmiths, but also masters and students of medicine, theology, law, and liberal arts. And like any other craftsman, a scholar needs money if he wants to make a living of his trade. In fact, this is still reflected in the academic titles today. In the 12th century, a master or magister simply referred to the head of a workshop, a university or universitas, as we will see later in this episode, referred to a guild of artisans. To sum up, the Western medieval intellectuals were children of the city, where cathedral schools took over from monasteries as centers of learning and became the precursors of the universities. Our first stop takes us to the pulsating streets of Paris and Chartres in the early 12th century, home to a group of bohemian intellectuals known as the Goliards. They praised intellectual freedom, sang songs about the joys of life, and used alter egos to criticize authorities, even though most of them belonged to the elite themselves. High or low, peasant or noble, the Goliath attacked everyone. The Pope was depicted as an all-devouring lion, a bishop as a sluggish calf. To make matters worse, the Goliath composed some pretty outspoken poems about wine, games, and illicit love or the medieval equivalent of sex, drugs and rock and roll, if you will. Among Paris' growing band of students and masters, we also find one of the most important intellectuals in European history. I'm of course thinking of Pierre Abelard, a.k.a. Peter Abelard. Luckily for us, he recorded his life story, Historia Calimatatum, or History of My Struggles. Abelard was born on the outskirts of Nantes in 1079. He abandoned a military career to pursue a life of learning. When he became a master, he quickly gathered a flock of loyal students who were drawn to his eloquence and brilliantly restless mind. Filled with an awareness of his own worth, to use his own words, he launched a merciless attack on the old Parisian masters. His first target was William of Champeaux, in his autobiography, Abelard describes the conflict as an epic battle of Homeric proportions. Abelard cast himself as Ajax and the old master as Hector. If you ask who won, I say with modest pride, I was not defeated. Abelard continued his ascent to academic stardom, excelling in topics such as logic, philosophy and theology, daringly insisting on using reason to shine a light on the big questions. But then his career was violently interrupted. As in all good stories, the stone in his path was a forbidden love affair. Eloise was a young woman when Abelard first met her. Not bad-looking, 
and incredibly talented. Her uncle, Fulbert, wanted Abelard to attend to her education, and he happily agreed. It didn't take long before the inevitable happened. My hand strayed oftener to her bosom than to the pages, Abelard tells us. Eloise became pregnant with their son, Astrolabe, named after an astronomical instrument. Talk about intellectual or pretentious parents. Abelard feared the affair would interfere with his career, so they married in secret. To kill all rumors, Eloise joined a convent, but the couple had forgotten about Fulbert. He thought Abelard had rejected and dishonored his knees. One night, a gang led by Fulbert snuck into Abelard's room and put him in his place. They held him down, and a surgeon, with a relaxed interpretation of the Hippocratic Oath, castrated Abelard. Ouch. The humiliated Abelard took refuge in the Abbey of Saint-Denis, from where he and Eloise would continue their love affair through letters. But castrated or not, Abelard still had balls. Everywhere he went, he stirred up controversies. In his famous treatise, Yes and No, he writes, By doubting, we come to inquiry, and by inquiry, we see the truth. But he also seemed to put reason before theology, which was a no-no. In 1121, a synod in Soissons condemned his works as heretical and forced him to burn them and publicly recant. Around 1126, Abelard became the abbot of a monastery in Brittany, where the local monks tried to poison him. He fled to Paris and took up teaching again, only to pick a new fight with the imposing figure of Abbot Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, the big reformer of the Benedictine order. In a letter, Clairvaux explained his beef with Abelard. He has defiled the church. He has infected with his own blight the minds of simple people. He tries to explore with his reason what the devout mind grasps at once with a vigorous faith. Faith believes, it does not dispute. But this man, apparently holding God's suspect, will not believe anything until he has first examined it with his reason. This time, Abelard was out of his depth. In 1140, the controversy led to a second trial in the city Saint. His views on the Trinity were too controversial, so once again he was forced to burn his works and condemned to silence by the Pope. Abelard took refuge in a new monastery, where he died a broken man on April 21, 1142. Though at least Abelard was reunited with his beloved Eloise in death, as they lie buried together in the same grave at the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. Abelard never got to pursue a university career, because it was still another 60 years before the university saw the day of light. They evolved as students and masters like Abelard and his disciples formed guilds based on the new corporate idea, which meant that legal persons could have rights and privileges as a corporate entity. In the Middle Ages, a guild was known as an universitas, so a guild of students and masters was known as an universitas magistorium et scolarium. The first universities were formed in Paris and Bologna around the year 1200. Some historians claim that Paris is the oldest. Others hand the prize to Bologna. But if you had to choose, the year 1200 is a good place to start. That's when French King Philip Augustus issued a royal charter securing extensive privileges to the Parisian scholars. It appears the scholars still had some Goliard blood pumping in their veins, because the background was a bar fight. Yep, Europe's first university was born because of a brawl over bad wine. According to the English chronicler Master Roger of Houghton, the conflict escalated when a provost and his armed men broke into a student's hostel and killed a student. The academic community was furious. They demanded the killers be arrested. The king suggested a trial by ordeal, but the scholars wanted the men to be flocked at school. According to scholar of medieval history Mia Münster-Svensson, this is the first recorded instance when the community of scholars spoke 
acted and was treated as a unanimous corporation that would give the students the same privileges as clerics. The next decisive moment happened in 1215, when the Pope granted the university its first official statutes. Within a few years, Oxford joined the club of universities as a close third on the other side of the channel. Then came Montpellier, Cambridge, Salamanca, and so on. By 1300, 18 universities had emerged across the continent, and by 1500, the number had grown to 70. From a modern perspective, one thing that really strikes you is just how democratic the first universities were. Anyone with the right intellectual capacities were welcome, and the scholars were an extremely diverse lot, both in terms of age, nationality, and their socioeconomic backgrounds. The majority of scholars were not of high birth. If anything, nobles were a rare breed, and most scholars came from what you'd call the middle class of clerics, merchants, and craftsmen. So by the mid-13th century, the universities had won a large extent of what you might call institutional freedom. But what to do with this new freedom? And this is where it gets really interesting from the point of view of inquiry and academic freedom. Medieval universities consisted of four faculties, one of law, one of medicine, one of theology, and one of liberal arts. But what did they actually teach, and where did the limits go? The seven liberal arts are an inheritance from antiquity. They're traditionally divided into a trivium of grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and a mathematical quadrivium of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. In other words, the liberal arts are all pagan subjects, but due to the blessings of Christian greats such as Augustine and the monk Boethius, a select number of pagan ideas were acceptable as a strictly utilitarian tool or handmaiden to understanding Christian doctrine. In fact, to some, pagan ideas had not just become kosher. Some medieval scholars actually regarded themselves as dwarfs perched on the shoulder of giants. As Bernard of Chartres put it in the 12th century, though most people think this quote originated with the much later Isaac Newton. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, classical manuscripts were rescued and copied during the Carolingian reforms in the 9th century. But crucially, these did not include Greek works. In the 12th and 13th centuries, the steady trickle of classical manuscripts turned into an outright fountain. This was not least thanks to the earlier efforts of Abbasid caliphs like Al-Mansur, who, as we saw last episode, initiated the translation of almost all ancient Greek works. Islamic rock star philosophers such as Avicenna and Averroes, who commented on the translations and wrote their own works, were also crucial in making Greek thought accessible to Latin Europe. These works would be translated by luminaries such as Abelard of Bath and Gerard of Cremona, who scoured the newly reconquered libraries in Sicily and Toledo for Arabic translations and comments on science and philosophy. This prompted an interest in the original Greek manuscripts, and luckily, monks and scholars in the Byzantine Empire had revived the interest in classical learning, making Greek manuscripts available for curious Latin scholars such as William of Morbeke. As more and more manuscripts were translated, they became the core curriculum across all four faculties. In the Faculty of Medicine, Hippocrates and Galen were taken up. Their writings were collected and joined by the texts of Avicenna, Averroes, and our old friend the free-thinking Razi. Students of mathematics and astronomy rediscovered Euclid and Ptolemy. In Bologna, where the Faculty of Law dominated, rhetoric was the queen of liberal arts, and another old friend of the podcast, Cicero, became an integral part of the curriculum. By the middle of the 13th century, the seven liberal arts were supplemented by the three philosophies, natural, moral, and metaphysical. Students of philosophy delved into Plato and, of course, the ultimate game-changer, Aristotle. 
And since obtaining a Bachelor of Arts was a prerequisite for going on to study theology, law and medicine, almost all students would be steeped in Aristotelian philosophy when his works weren't banned. A couple of Aristotle's manuscripts had already been translated into Latin in the early 6th century by the Christian philosopher Boethius. But it wasn't until the Islamic encounters in the 12th and 13th centuries, when the bulk of Aristotle's manuscripts were rediscovered, that his huge impact on everything from natural philosophy to politics made a breakthrough. Aristotle would indisputably become the most influential thinker in European university, and indeed European thought, for centuries. In the famous Italian poet Dante's Divine Comedy, Dante finds Aristotle in limbo, the milder circle of hell, despite being a pagan. And Aristotle is referred to as the master of those who know. Aristotle's ridiculous long list of works spanning fields including logic, philosophy, physics, biology and astronomy, coupled with his systematic, rigorous and rationalistic approach, was as hypnotizing for medieval Christian scholars as it had been for Muslim philosophers such as Avicenna, Farabi and Averroes. It was as if the intellectuals of the age were suddenly given a super drug. But instead of releasing dopamine, it triggered the centers of reason and inquiry, allowing the medieval mind to grasp and formulate entirely new concepts, opening up novel worlds and providing the means of exploring them. In fact, some argue that the Aristotelian myth was so addictive that many scholars just couldn't kick the habit and became blind to the flaws in the writings of the old master. But those who knew how to dose and refine their intake would use the genius of Aristotle and Greek learning to significantly improve on the classical heritage. In fact, historian of medieval science Edward Grant argues that with the introduction of Greek works in general, and Aristotelian philosophy in particular, medieval universities institutionalized the use of reason, creating what he calls a culture of poking around. This would create the foundation for later scientific breakthroughs and indeed become emblematic of Western civilization as such. A killer app had been developed. Some of the most important discoveries of the Middle Ages that opened the way for later scientific breakthroughs were made by the so-called Oxford Calculators from Merton College in Oxford. Their achievements include the formulation of a new set of mathematical rules for motion and changes in the speed of moving bodies, as well as rules for measuring changes in the degrees of physical qualities such as cold and heat. Issues that I even when surrounded by 21st century technologies these scholars could only dream of, really, I'm at a loss to properly understand. This was also a good example of medieval thinkers outthinking and discarding Aristotelian dogma when shown to come up short. The mathematical tools and mechanical terms developed by the Oxford calculators and their peers across the channel were used by Galileo in his mechanical breakthroughs. According to the medievalist Gordon Leff, it was the medieval thinkers such as the calculators who took the first steps toward a physics founded on measurement and calculation, even if they lacked empirical application. Closer to Earth, but no less important, you can thank long-forgotten medieval inventors for spectacles, the mechanical clock, the blast furnace and the windmill. The High Middle Ages would not yet completely invert the relationship between reason and revelation. It was still unthinkable to reject Christian doctrines. The incessant questioning of hypotheticals that characterized the scholastic method may seem ridiculous to people of our age, where strict empiricism and controlled experimentation is king. But the use of reason by these scholastics would dramatically change the limits of permissible inquiry although the questions posed would still ultimately be an attempt to explain God's eternal truths. As with all revolutionary ideas, Aristotelian philosophy would also have its detractors who thought the use of reason had become a little too independent and daring. After all, Aristotle was not exactly a proto-Christian. For one, he did not believe in a God who actively intervened in the world, nor in heaven and hell. 
The Islamic scholar Averroes and his radical interpretation of Aristotle's ideas especially raised some eyebrows in the theological faculty. One of the controversial ideas he held was the notion of the eternal universe. This obviously didn't square with Christian doctrine. As everyone knows, the universe was created by God. Genesis and all. While theologians explicitly used Aristotle to discern the truths of Christianity and God's creation, natural philosophers at the arts faculties had a more quote-unquote secular approach. They used the recently unlocked upgrade of Aristotelian philosophy to probe the big questions of existence and knowledge with little or no reference to God or Christian doctrine. This did not mean that natural philosophers were atheists or even skeptics. They were pious Christians, but thought of theology and philosophy as two largely separate spheres. And since God had both created the world and endowed humans with reason, it was only natural that humans use the latter to explore the form. Though they didn't question Christian doctrine as such, there doesn't seem to have been any al Rawandis or Rasis among the medieval scholastics. Were the scholars then free to study whatever they wanted to? Not exactly. When the communities of scholars became autonomous universities, policing academic orthodoxy became an internal affair. The bodies of masters, especially of theology, who acted under the authority of the local bishop, got to set the limits. It appears they were good at covering for each other, because everyone who were either accused or prosecuted for heretical views between 1200 and 1280 were either students of theology or masters of art, the junior introductory faculty. Which also points to a conflict between theologians and natural philosophers on where the limit between these disciplines should be drawn. And the theologians would not sit idly by when they thought that natural philosophers overstepped their bounds and brought reason to bear on central tenets of revelation that rested on faith alone. The first documented case of academic censure at the University of Paris happened just a few years after its birth. In 1206, Master Amalric of Ben was found guilty of false teaching on the grounds that he advocated pantheism. He was forced to recant his views in front of his fellow scholars. According to one chronicler, the humiliated master died of shame shortly afterwards. Apparently this warning had not been heeded by 1210. So to settle the score beyond doubt, Amalric was posthumously excommunicated, exhumed and buried in unconsecrated ground. Moreover, an ecclesiastical council condemned ten of Amalric's followers, including a teacher and two students from the university, to be burned as heretics and others were imprisoned. Aristotle's teaching on natural philosophy were banned, both in private and public, and books by an Aristotelian scholar were confiscated. Amalric might have been the first, but he certainly wasn't the last. There are about 50 known cases of academically related judicial proceedings for erroneous or false teachings in the 13th and 14th centuries. The Parisian ban on Aristotle was renewed by the Holy See in 1215, and in 1228 Aristotle caused trouble again. Pope Gregory IX wrote a letter to the Faculty of Theology at Paris accusing it of committing adultery with philosophical doctrines. Still, the Pope's hands could only reach so far. During a great strike in 1229, Henry III invited the Parisian masters to come and teach anywhere in England where academic freedom included Aristotle's natural philosophy. That the ecclesiastical authorities in Paris had to keep condemning Aristotle is also a sign that his teachings kept reappearing. 13th century scholars banned from using Aristotle must have felt like modern college kids writing term papers without Wi-Fi. What? No Wikipedia? The English invitation put pressure on the Pope. When he repeated his ban in 1238, he introduced a loophole. From now on, the books were only banned until they had been examined and purged from every suspicion of error. And in 1255, Aristotle was back on the Paris curriculum. But the uneasy relationship between Aristotle and the theologians meant that scholars needed to make Aristotle kosher again. And the scholastic doctor, 
Albert the Great, and his student, a certain Dominican friar named Thomas Aquinas, answered their call. Born in 1225, Thomas Aquinas became one of the most influential thinkers of European history when he set out to find a feasible synthesis between Aristotelian philosophy and revelation. As we saw, one of Aristotle's most problematic ideas was that of the eternal universe. But Aquinas found a way to hack Aristotle and patch Holy Scripture so as to make the two compatible. In his Metaphysics, Aristotle had stated that everything in motion must have been moved by something else, that all effects have a cause. But the chain of causation cannot continue forever, Aquinas reasoned. Somewhere down the line, if you just keep on tracing the chain far enough, you'll find a first unmoved mover who set all the dominoes in motion. God was back in the equation. Aquinas became extremely influential. He even became a saint of the Catholic Church, belying the idea that the Church was opposed to reason as such. But Aristotle, especially in their various interpretation, still rubbed some people the wrong way. In 1272, the University of Paris made philosophers swear an oath not to throw theology into the mix when philosophizing. If they did mention Christian doctrines, they had to side with orthodoxy. Then, in 1277, just three years after Aquinas died, a double condemnation was issued, both in Paris by the bishop and in Oxford by the Archbishop of Canterbury. In January 1277, Pope John XXII sent a letter to Bishop Tampier of Paris asking him to examine rumors that heresy had infected the university. Apparently, Paris was no longer a safe space. The bishop consulted 16 masters of theology to examine a list of heretical propositions, sort of a medieval equivalent to the University of California's list of microaggressions, though the medieval version was not meant to merely inspire. After much bickering, the bishop compiled a final draft of 219 propositions that were condemned and whose teaching was henceforth banned. The propositions dealt with issues such as the nature of God, divine knowledge and omnipotence, free will and the nature of philosophy and theology. Some were aimed at Averroes' ideas, others directly touched upon the teachings of Aquinas. Here's a couple of interesting examples. Proposition number 176 was the idea that happiness is found in this life and not in another, so you probably wouldn't find many carpe diem tattoos on campus. Critique of the Bible was also a no-no. Proposition number 174. The Christian law has its fables and errors like other religions. Scholars disagree on exactly why the 219 propositions were banned. But it seems likely that the bishop was acting out of a concern that natural philosophy had become too independent of revelation and needed to be reined in. But the bishop was not beyond being petty in the turf war between theologians and philosophers. So these propositions were banned too. Theology is based on fables and you can't learn anything from theology. Yet the propositions were met with strong reactions from the academic community. Godfrey of Fontaine, a secular master at the Faculty of Theology, launched an attack on the articles, calling them incomprehensible, untrue, and impossible. And when in 1323 Thomas Aquinas was made a saint, the condemnations had to be amended to accommodate Aquinas' thought. The double condemnation was a sign of times to come. Broadly speaking, universities tended to become less autonomous and more intolerant towards the late Middle Ages. For one, secular and ecclesiastical authorities started copying the institution as it became increasingly popular. The second generation of universities from the 14th and 15th centuries didn't involve on their own. They were established. The first established university was founded in Naples in 1224, where the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II wanted to educate his own bureaucracy instead of having to rely on the University of Bologna. Pope Gregory IX quickly followed suit and opened the first papal university in Toulouse in 1229. 
But of course, there's no such thing as a free education. In return for their patronage, the emperors, kings and popes wanted a say in the content of what was taught. The decline in academic independence didn't just affect the new generation of established universities. The universities in Paris and Bologna also started succumbing to increasing state control. Generally speaking, the academic environment also became increasingly intolerant during the late Middle Ages. In the 14th century, new propositions were condemned at Paris and added to the existing ones, totaling 16 lists of banned ideas that were published in collections. In 1339 and 1340, the Masters of Arts in Paris issued two statutes for the first time censuring false teachings at the Faculty of Art. The statutes prohibited the thoughts of William of Ockham, the man behind the famous principle, Ockham's Razor. Or rather, the statutes were aimed at those who spread his ideas. Unfortunately, the statutes don't provide any clues as to which of Ockham's ideas were problematic. But it was likely his scientific rather than his theological views that caused trouble, since the statutes were issued at the Faculty of Arts and not Theology. Bachelors of Arts were required to take an oath, swearing to observe the statutes made by the Faculty of Arts against the Occamist thought, and that you shall not sustain said thought and similar ones in whatever way. A few years later, in 1346, the philosopher Nicolas of Autrecourt was condemned for false teachings. Autrecourt has been called the medieval Hume because of his supposed skepticism, although this picture has been challenged. Skeptic or not, a commission of prelates and theologians discussed his works and came to the conclusion that many of his statements were false, dangerous, presumptuous, suspect, erroneous and heretical. He was forced to burn his works and publicly recant. Then he was stripped of his magisterial status in arts and banned from ever becoming a master of theology. Again, politics and bickering might have had a decisive role to play in his condemnation too, but the fact that you could use accusations of false teachings as a reprisal against your enemies is testament to an increasingly intolerant environment. Even as church and secular authorities clamped down on academic freedom, the intellectual genie had been let out of the bottle as a result of the happy but explosive marriage of universities and classical learning. This union begot a legacy of insatiable curiosity and inquiry that could only be satisfied by the use of reason. And while long and winding, the road towards the scientific revolution and the age of reason had been paved. Today, we laugh and shake our heads in bewilderment at the propositions and teachings banned by the moral panics caused by Aristotelian natural philosophy. No one wants to be the 21st century version of Bishop Tempier. But no doubt, many in medieval times genuinely felt that the banned ideas were dangerous and undermined the very basis of Christian society without which man was lost. This should concern those whom author Jonathan Rauch has called the kindly inquisitors of our day, the deans, administrators, and students whose attempt to banish modern secular heresies from curricula, classes, and campuses may be born out of the best intentions. Theology may have been challenged by natural philosophy, and their relationship was often uneasy and uncomfortable, as reason made inroads into questions previously thought the exclusive domain of revelation. But both theology and natural philosophy, and ultimately the university as an institution, prospered from these clashes. They helped bring about the very intellectual and scientific infrastructure that sustain modern civilization. Is there any reason to think that we in the 21st century have advanced so far that new attempts at defining truth and dogma in academia will ensure progress rather than decay? Thank you so much for listening. Today's episode was edited by Søren Stehøj, and Matthias Meyer contributed with essential research. Next episode, 
will be an expert opinion with philosophy professor Peter Adamson of the University of Munich. You might know Peter Adamson as the cheerful voice on the incredibly ambitious and enlightening podcast, The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. Peter and I will try to ignore our common passion for Arsenal Football Club and the burning question of Wenger in or out. Instead, we'll focus on free thinking and free thinkers of medieval Islam and Christianity. That's in two weeks, here on Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech.